here The Watchman presents The Future of America with Mike Kerr. Isaiah 21, 6 says, For thus the Lord said unto me, Go, set a watchman, let him declare what he sees. Today, Mike Kerr and his fellow watchmen discuss current events through a biblical lens and how these events affect us, the future of America, and the world we live in. Hi, everybody. This is Mike Kerr, and this is The Future of America here on November 15th. And we're coming at you today with part two of our series interviewing a sergeant with the Sheriff's Department in the state of Washington. And it's Patrick McCurdy. Patrick, thank you for joining us. Good morning. It's happy. I'm happy to be here, Mike. Good to see you. Good to see you. You know, Patrick, a lot's going on right now out there. We have the uh, GOP uh, with a lead going into the midterms this year. Uh, that is the highest lead they have had going into the midterms, according to the polls. Uh, in, in, like I said, 40 years, 40 years, uh, because we're upset by what's going on in our country today. And it was the Democratic Party who pushed the defund the police regime uh, that you fell victim to in many ways. Uh, and we also have the Rittenhouse trial coming to basically a head, uh, which I truly believe he will be acquitted acquitted uh and then we have all kinds of stuff threats from black lives matters and others about protests and riots what are we looking at patrick from a sheriff's perspective here well um from a sheriff's perspective i it's kind of uh interesting uh first of all we talk about the polls and i've never once been asked a question in a poll about uh, the voting or politics have you <laughs> so i we know that um those i don't know how they gather that necessarily i could research it but um it is not a a poll of everyone around us it is a, a often a guesstimate and it's a select group of people and so i have come to believe that a lot of that stuff um is put out there sometimes to bait crowds or motivate crowds to vote in different areas, et cetera. For example, if one group feels like they're falling behind, I, I feel it's a, a very um, deliberate thing that's put out there sometimes. So I don't put a lot of stake in that. But I do put stake in the fact that people are upset and people are trying to change things that have happened. Um, <clears throat> from a sheriff's perspective, um, we definitely are preparing, and I know that um, all the big cities are for something that might happen. There's a lot of talk about what people are going to do. Um, you talked about the Rittenhouse trial, and uh, that judge is receiving threats now, which is um, normal. I mean, if you are going to go against the mainstream narrative, or if you're going to go against the grain, that's what happens. Um, the a lot of the subversive groups that are doing this, they operate that way, uh, often with overt threats that um, sometimes mean nothing, but sometimes they do. We've seen violence um, occur and happen to these people in numerous circumstances around the country. Um, from our perspective, it's uh, very different than it was just a few years ago. At one point recently, I was having a conversation with somebody and they were talking about riots. And, uh, and there is a difference between protesting and riot. Uh, you and I would go protest if the circumstance or situation was right. I would certainly go out there uh, to stand up for something that I believe in. As an American, we can do that. But the riots are different. The riots are when they have wanton vandalism and violence, et cetera. In Seattle, uh, I was joking with you. I don't know if I said it during the interview or not, but that means it's Tuesday in Seattle. <laughs> uh, the, the store owners board up their stores in advance, preparing for something like that. Um, Seattle Police Department will double their numbers. They have officers from all the different precincts that can roll in, um, put on their gear and respond. And we do a similar response, but we don't have the ability to multiply our numbers like they do. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of um, watching and waiting and preparing. What we used to do is be, as the sheriff's department, uh, as, way, as far back as 1999 during WTO, we would come in and take a very aggressive stance and uh, essentially stop the behavior in certain areas, control it, make arrests. But that's not how we operate in law enforcement in general anymore. 
And um, there's a lot more, uh, a lot less control of crowds that are doing these things, and a lot less ability to control those crowds. So if you are in a major urban area, um, it's a good idea always to have extra food and water and things on hand, uh, especially if you live in city limits where you could be affected. Um, keep a pack in your car in case you have to park your car on the side of the road and walk home full of items. Um, be prepared with those types of things too. Well, you know, it's interesting, Patrick, that you bring that particular point up. Uh, you have been, and we're going to talk a little deeper about this later, you've been transferred up to a more rural area now. And I live in a very rural area. And, and we're always prepared where we live. But the whole Rittenhouse thing and everything that's going on in my town where I live is really a non-event. I mean, we really see it as uh, it, it won't affect us in this town. However, we prepare. And the other thing is we don't understand it because when we hear the testimony, the prosecution pulls someone up on the stand and he says, I pointed a gun at him and he shot me. Well, where I live, that's like, well, that's a no-brainer. Of course he did. I mean, now you're in the rural community patrolling. What do you find? Is it different than the city? Oh, it is. Um, yesterday, uh, I was driving along, and I was in one of our smart, small towns, and uh, it's called Carnation. And a huge crowd of people was there waving uh, blue line flags. <laughs> and they were, I mean, instead of waving with one finger, they waved with their whole hand. <laughs> and they were, I, I mean, so kind and gracious and then several trucks rolled in with uh blue line flags and they all were saying god bless you sheriff and it's very different from being downtown where they wave with the one finger instead of the whole hand yeah. and uh, well, <laughs> you know <laughs> um sorry go ahead you know it's 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 interesting yesterday uh we had uh jim woodcock who's uh the producer of this show and also uh does a lot of worship uh for us on our our Thursday night uh, worship uh, here at Hear the Watchman. And uh, his daughter, they were, he was up with his daughter, they were staying with us. And his daughter and I uh, got in our side by side, and I was taking her up into the high country so she could actually experience what mountain life's really about. And we were going out the road, uh, dirt road, to get up into the mountains. And there was a sheriff's deputy in his truck parked over on the side of the road. And it's completely natural. For us up here, I stopped and asked him, are you okay? Is everything good? And, you know, we exchanged thumbs up. That's it. But that's the way we handle it up here. Across America, that's not the case, is it? Well, you know, um, my job is, is very volatile in general. Um, I, I believe that people kind of sway with the tide. If um, September 11th occurs and you see very heroic men and women running into harm's way, suddenly people are uh, going out of their way to come to me and thank me um, and, and the people around me. Uh, you know, you'll go to Starbucks and they'll say, um, you know, hey, the people in front of you bought the coffee for the group or something, and which we aren't supposed to do. It puts us in a weird circumstance, but we're very gr grateful. And what we'll do is in order to pay it back, we'll buy coffee for the people behind us or something like that. But um, then there will be a violent event like the one we saw in Minneapolis. And uh, then suddenly it's very difficult. I have seen a progressive decline in my ability to interact with um, the people in the neighborhoods that I patrol, often very high crime uh, neighborhoods. Um, the, um, the ability to interact, something I always felt I was good at. I don't feel I have a lot of natural skill. I feel I have to work at things very hard, but that's one thing just talking to people that I felt I was good at. And um, it was odd to go up to a person on the street and start that conversation that I do anyway. You know, with you, I was joking about how we both coordinated flannel shirts today. <laughs> and I'll say something like that, you know. <laughs> I'll say, uh, you know, man, those Mariners, they tanked it yesterday. Or, or you know, uh, man, those shoes must cost a lot of money. I need to borrow those next time I direct traffic because they're so bright you can see them a mile away. You know, I'll start a conversation and I, I have seen a decline in that where people will not only um, ignore me 
and turn and walk away, but sometimes say things I'm not going to repeat here. And, uh, uh, and, and in fact, I've seen attempts at friendly conversation like that turn into um, overt, rude challenges. I don't, uh, you know, um, I don't know how else to say it without saying what they said. You know, people responding without the kindness that you had. Uh, the same thing happened to me. I was on a very rural road and I was trying to look at a golden eagle. <laughs> that was the only reason I pulled over and a guy stopped to make sure I was okay. So I, I do think that there are, in America, that still happens uh, overall, but I think that people just sway with the tide. Um, and frankly, we can come back to this, but I think it's because um, of a lack of faith. When you put your faith in any person or uh, any political system or anything that's happening in the world, that will fail you. And frankly, I wish it wasn't the case, but we in law enforcement will fail you sometimes. We, we try really hard to put good people in place, but we don't always get all the people we want. And that's true for any job. You've had bad teachers and bad doctors and a bad mailman on occasion. And those people really make a negative impression that lasts a long time. But with me, we have perhaps an even bigger impact than some of those people because um, it often is in the media and we affect a person's freedom and then sometimes uh, a person's life. Uh, we are, are granted the ability to take a life, which is no small thing and um, should be revered and, and honored and we should train for that, but it doesn't always go well when you're talking about that. So um, I'm not sure if I fully answered the question, but yeah, there, in most of America, I feel that they uh, know and respect police officers because people have been taught that, but um, it changes day to day with what we see in the news. And a lot of that is deliberate. A lot of that is intentional, trying to paint the picture that is needed for that time. I think we all understand that. Well, I think, you know, Patrick, you know, there people will... Uh, you know, I don't know, universally, I think, talk ill of the police because they don't want to get a speeding ticket or something like that. But when something goes sideways and the police are called, when they show up, it's like the second coming of Christ has arrived at your house because you're in trouble and you need help. And I think that in America, we kind of dipped into a situation and a time where that people didn't realize that they didn't realize that that you know that the police were there when they needed them just by a phone call which may not be the, quite the case anymore i mean you look at the major cities let's just look at your city seattle uh i shared a report with you last week where uh it's the city employees in the county buildings and all that had to have armed security guards escort them to their cars or to the uh, public transportation sites to go home because they were afraid that they'd be attacked. The same thing in New York, uh, Chicago, other cities. And at the same time, you're seeing men and women in uniform standing up to that thing they're trying to sell us to put in our arm, and they're being reassigned as in your case or they they completely leave florida was paying huge bonuses for new york police officers to come down there uh and and take a job in florida uh what do you see the trend doing i mean i we we talked last week and we'll talk a little bit more right now about your situation uh you were effectively moved out of out of the downtown area into the rural area which has been a blessing uh, but it, all because you were making a stand, is that right? Well, I, I think that um, it, there are a couple of things. It's not necessarily because of that. Um, it, well, to be clear, it's not because of that, because that um, particular cir circumstance, that issue that I'm making a stand on um, is still being decided. And um, actually with the things that are happening and the new medical studies, I feel pretty good about that, and I'm not sure. And, and I want to also say, I know uh, Derek Gilbert has been very eloquent saying this when you spoke to him, that I don't, um, because that is my opinion that I reach through prayer and fasting, it doesn't mean that I necessarily 
believe that um, people shouldn't have the choice and the ability to do that. There are a lot of valid reasons where people would choose that. And I have family members that have and, and certainly don't judge that. Um, but I think that there's an accumulation of things. And uh, there's so many things happening that we could be better at. Um, we talked a little bit about the way that we um, treat people. And, you know, um, when I deal with a, a person who is abusive in my job, um, very often that stems from being the victim of an abuser or, um, I mean, you have one of two options sometimes, unless you take the really hard road and come out of that. When you're abused, you become an abuser or you become abused and you become a victim or a suspect in that. And I think that we have so many things that are falling apart within the country and the legal system that people are taking a stand on those things. And, uh, you know, the, the inability to arrest people, the fact that we may be losing qualified immunity in the state, which means we can be sued in the performance of our duties personally, instead of them levying it towards or uh, uh, leveling it, excuse me, towards the police department itself, and we won't have that protection. Um, I know people who've been involved in shootings that were justified and deemed to be so, they could lose their certification, and there are also some of them uh, going to trial for that with homicide charges. And, and uh, it makes this job seem not worthwhile, as honorable as we try to be, and as uh, motivated as we are to do those things, and the reasons that we signed up seem to pale in comparison to while going to prison for doing our job or um, trying to do the right thing and detaining a person, but not being in a context where we can do that anymore. So uh, I, I know, I apologize if I rambled a little bit, but it's, it's a combination of things that are leading to that. Now, I'd like to address something if I can on those mm -hmm. lines. There is a, a danger in that because um, as a Sergeant, I'm in charge of men and women and my job is to bring them into harm's way and safely bring them back again. And uh, we talked about the skills that I've had to work to develop. Well, that's one I'm, I'm blessed to be good at. And I, I bring people into harm's way and I bring them safely back. It's a lot harder because harm's way no longer means a physical threat. It doesn't mean the person shooting the rounds. It means legally I have to protect them too which is really hard where I tell people in circumstances where I feel we should be going in and providing a service and I tell them to stand down. And that's really hard. It's also hard too, because there is a tangible fear. Uh, one of my guys uh, recently made a mistake. Uh, the call was about a woman threatening security guards with a gun and to resolve it because he didn't have a tangible crime, he went to transporter and I was gonna pick up my radio and say, search her before you put her in the car, do it. But then I hesitated because he's senior to me. Um, I, I wanted to be respectful. I didn't want to sound like I was second guessing him. But in a few minutes, he said, well, she had a gun. She had it with her. And he didn't do it because he couldn't in his mind process quickly enough the legality of it and was afraid and said, well, I don't know in this circumstance if I can do it, et cetera. So we have officers that are now much more vulnerable, much more exposed. And in turn, the public is because we're not as competent and capable as we were just a few years ago. And there's also a filtering too. When you have people, I want that guy who's going to say to me, when I write up an operations plan or have a, a, a deployment, or I say, listen up guys, here's what we're going to do. You go there, go around the back, secure the perimeter. I want somebody who's going to say, uh, negative Sarge, that's not safe. And, I, and if they have to, I want them to speak up and be vocal and maybe we can hash it out there. I've always respected that. But that ability to do that is being shut down. They don't, they, in a general term, um, mean, meaning primarily the government in some of these areas, don't want people who speak up. They want silence. They want you to just go with the program and do what you're told. And that's where I take my stand is on that general principle. So it's not any one thing but it's that general principle. But when you lose those people, uh, what do you have? I mean, in Canada, we have ministers being dragged out of their churches, leading a congregation. Since when is that okay? Then, if the, as if that wasn't enough, they complied because their churches were locked up by the government, and they started having uh, private groups in their home, and they tracked them down with drones, police officers. My brothers and sisters who've taken the same oath, similar oath in a different country to what I did. But what about England? Similar things. Ireland. And what about Australia? 
I mean, the things that those officers are doing there under the, the umbrella of the law, that's, that's where people should be taking their stand. They should be standing up and saying, no, I'm not going to arrest this person for a Facebook post, or no, I'm not going to uh, abuse physically this person who's legally protesting. And so uh, that's what I'm scared of. That's what frightens me in all of this is where um, this filtering, this shaking that is going on as we shake the things and separate the chafe from the wheat, um, what's going to be left over? And so that's where I'm concerned. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree with you more there, Patrick. I mean, it's 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 kind of where we at. So, you know, we we have this uh, ignition point, for lack of a better term, coming up here in the next few days. Uh, where where is it that we need to turn as a country right now to get things sort of back into perspective to to be able to feel safe in America. Perfectly framed. Um, America may not be a country in a few years. It may be. Um, you know, any of these places that I mentioned may not be. We have a, a game plan, a battle plan that's been established for us. And we know uh, some of the threats that we're going to face. And we talked about it a little bit, and that's the purpose of your show, and it's here in the Word, and that's where we need to turn, because um, truly, if America were to collapse, I still have the same values that I've had, and I know that I can align myself with people like you, and we can lament that loss, or we can be thrilled by the horrible circumstances around us, like I said, because it means that this is true. Uh, his steadfast love endures forever. And, uh, you know, I look at Luke here, Luke 21, 36, but stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all those things that are going to take place and to stand before the son of man. And again, his steadfast love endures forever. Um, There's so many things here that give us a battle plan. And, and, you know, you don't want to go into a conflict with somebody who says, um, all right, guys, just go <laughs> do something, you know, and sometimes that is the case, but we don't have that. This is for thousands of years now, this has been established and we know this is coming, you know, um, and we know too that we will be carried through this. We will be supported in this. If we look back in um, Exodus, God provided bread for his people as they wandered in the desert, mana, right? Ma uh, I almost said magically, it certainly isn't, and forgive me for that, but what a supernatural event to provide them with that. But then let's fast forward to the book of Revelations, and it says, you will not be able to buy or sell, and a day's wage is for a loaf of bread. So how are we supposed to accomplish that? Well, we have a battle plan in the Lord's Prayer, because Jesus says in it, and this isn't just a, it, it is, it is a guideline how we should pray, but he says in it, give us this day our daily bread. And I wonder, too, as we enter these hard times, that's not just bread for the soul or bread for the spirit. Uh, you know, we could talk about when Jesus was encountered by the devil who was tempting him, and he said, turn this rock into a loaf of bread. And he said, man does not live by bread alone. And we could take that meaning, or we could say, literally, he used to provide bread for his people in the middle of the desert. And I think he'll do the same for us. And for me, being on unstable ground and unstable footing is the best thing that could have happened because I am always an alpha type A leader, and I always have been. I mean, that's my role. When I was a little kid in Cub Scouts, I was a den leader, you know, or whatever my title was, and it's proceeded to this time, and I don't like not being in charge, but not being in charge has taught me that that unstable ground around me, I still have sure footing in front of me. So, amen. Amen. And we all we all really do know who's in charge. It's it's about accepting that and and living with that uh, on a daily basis. And and uh, you know I applaud you for for what you've done. You've you've you have truly shed a light of hope into police work uh, for those around the country that that feel lost right now. It's a dark dark time out there. Uh, can I say something about that? I'm sorry yeah, to interrupt. Um, I, I kind of feel that's my role too. Um, 
when um, I wanted to charge in and make a difference, there are circumstances where I can't. And um, what I can do, though, is be constant and be steady. And for those people, I'm surprised not only by the number of people that are coming forward in, in my job, people that I work with that I've known for years, and some that I haven't. I'm surprised by the number that are coming to me for whatever reason, for guidance and support, but also um, some of the people that I never thought I would have these conversations with. And that door is open. And frankly, too, being shaken, not in my faith, but in my circumstances, has been fantastic because it strips away my ego. Um, I, I am thankful for everything that happened. And I have no resentment towards anyone because um, I thought I was more important than I was, to be honest. I thought that what I did matters. And I thought that I was uh, making an impact. And I thought about all the things I've done and the differences I've made. And the truth is that if I'm gone, I'll be replaced. And I've learned that in a very um, black and white, stark reality that if I'm gone, I'll be quickly replaced. But I can still, with humility now, without my ego, instead of saying, uh, wow, this could be something that projects me forward or self-righteousness instead of actual righteousness, I can just talk to people because I have nothing to lose and no fear. And I feel, whether I'm right or wrong, that the time may be short. So I regret the times that I didn't do that in the past. Well, you know, we all learn, we all, we all go. I mean, you really are a shining light behind a badge for Jesus. I mean, and it's, it's wonderful to know that you're out there and you're touching the lives of so many as you go through your daily routine, you know, so we're, I'm going to try, here's what we're going to do, folks. I'm going to twist Patrick's arm. <laughs> and I think every week we're going to try and as his schedule permits, uh, we're going to try and have him back on this show for a sheriff's eyes view of what's going on in America. Uh, because I'm just, uh, I love interviewing you and, and it's so refreshing to always come back to Jesus and where Jesus is in all of this. So thank you for that, Patrick. No problem. If um, you're just tuning in and this is your first time hearing this, um, there is comfort in that. And sometimes it's hard to sift through this weighty library of books that are compiled into one leather bound thing. And so I'd be happy uh, to answer questions or help. Uh, if this is new to you, there is definitely comfort in this as the world around us seems to fall apart. So thank you, Mike, for the opportunity. I'd be honored to talk to you more often. Well, God bless. And hey, Patrick, how could people get in touch with you if they want to ask you specific questions? Well, um, I didn't have much of a social media presence. <laughs> I got rid of that stuff. I thought it was too cancerous, caustic. <laughs> so um, currently I do have an email. It's remnantarmy at protonmail.com. And um, I'll work to build that up. I do have a YouTube channel that has um, very little on it and it's Combat Concepts. And I will be working to revise that. And maybe, maybe I'll repost some of this in case people don't find it through your channel, et cetera. Um, and those are two ways right now. And then as we talk in the future, I'll come up with more ways to get a hold of me. I'll, <laughs> I'll delve back into that dark world of the social. <laughs> well, and here's a spoiler alert. I'm pretty sure he'll be in Dallas, Texas with us uh, at the next Hear the Watchman conference, March 17th through 20th. You can learn more about that at hearthewatchmenmen.com. Patrick, thank you for joining us today. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a chance to share a little bit of the word today. Thank you. Have a good day, Mike. Amen. Folks, that's going to wrap it up for this edition of The Future of America. We'll see you back tomorrow with a new edition and a new guest. And until then, God bless each and every one of you. And don't ever forget, never give up and always help your brothers and sisters. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless. You know, we're up here in the mountains of Idaho. We're just out enjoying God's gifts to all of us today. And I want to encourage you to get out to Grapevine, Texas and join us. We're doing a Hear the Watchman conference there, March 20, March 17th through the 21st at the Hilton Hotel. It's a wonderful opportunity for you to get enriched in what it is that God has to offer you. You'll hear speakers like Pastor Paul Bagley, Derek Gilbert and others talk about 
what it means to know moving forward biblically and practically what you need to do. Jamie Walden will be there and he will be off the hook teaching, teaching you what to do to prepare for the times ahead. So go over to hearthewatchmenmen.com. Get busy, get your reservation now. Group hotel rates will be out next week. You don't want to miss this one. Hear the Watchmen, M E N W W W dot Hear the Watchmen, M E N dot com. We'll see you in Grapevine, Texas. God bless each and every one of you. To support the work of Hear the Watchmen, find a way to get involved, or learn more about upcoming events, visit our website at www.hearthewatchmenmen.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Hear the Watchman Journey, and be sure to share our content on your social media. God bless you, and thanks for your prayers and support. And until next time, go be a watchman on the wall and declare all that God has shown you.